With that, um, I just want to introduce uh, our panelists uh, to uh, my immediate right. We have uh, Senator Phil, Phil Berger from North Carolina. Uh, next to him, we have uh, Daniel Pila, who's a policy advisor for the Heartland Institute and a number of other organizations, and Bob Williams um, with State Budget Solutions. Um, I guess I'll start off, uh, Senator Berger. Uh, North Carolina had some really uh, great um, state tax reform over the last couple of years. I know you led the charge on that. Can you tell us about what North Carolina did and maybe what other states can take out of that? The primary thing we did is, so we looked at our tax code in terms of how competitive we were with, with our neighbors and with other states, and we decided that there were a couple of things that needed to be done. One, uh, we needed to find a way to uh, lower our rates, uh, particularly our personal and corporate income tax rates. We also needed to, uh, to do that in the context of, uh, of reforming the tax code to try to uh, eliminate some of the uh, special deals that had been written to the tax code over the years. Uh, you know, talking about that is, uh, is fairly simple. Um, understanding the consequences of taking on those folks that have entrenched uh, interests in the, the current uh, breaks they have uh, became uh, a little more of a challenge than, than maybe we thought. But the other thing that people oftentimes don't fully realize when you're talking about tax reform, if you try to do tax reform uh, in, uh, in a context other than a, a recognition that you've got to control the spending side of things, uh, you're going to have uh, even more difficulty because one of the arguments that you hear from folks is that uh, when you change the tax code, you are going to reduce the dollars to government. And as, as difficult as that is uh, for me uh, to accept as being a problem, uh, there, there are a lot of folks who think that uh, the most important thing in the world is making sure that the government has uh, not just enough resources to do what government ought to be doing, but uh, unlimited resources to do whatever someone who uh, is involved in government can uh, come up with uh, what they consider to be a good idea to do. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I, I think you're seeing some uh, uh, some of the other proposals out there, like what Kansas did um, to cut their rates. Uh, they're getting you know some blowback from a lot of uh, mostly liberal groups attacking, saying, "Well, it's not bringing in the revenue that we expected." All these other things. Um, Bob, do you have any kind of take on on the revenue side? Because I think that is an important part. North, and I know Carolina, North Carolina did it the right way. Kansas was going to reduce the rates and widen the base. They reduced the rates. And didn't vote to buy the base, which was a problem. But I mean, one of the things we learned over the years, I was in the Washington legislature for 10 years, is a lot of times when legislators raise tax rates, they get less revenue than before they do. And if you do, like North Carolina's doing, they're, they're going to move ahead. And that's why, you know, I'm very active in ALEC. But we really like the rich states, poor states vote, which identify what's happening. And uh, a lot of people are moving out of Illinois. <laughs> There's a lot of people going to out of this state and they'll say get some changes here. And of course California is the big loser. Yeah. The, the other thing, if I could add, that we did that, that I thought was extremely important is we had a progressive rate structure in North Carolina and we moved from a progressive structure to a flat structure. And uh, it's, it's our feeling that 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 makes us not just more competitive from the standpoint of, of our, our rates, but it makes us more competitive from the standpoint of making sure that you have the right kind of, of, of interest in your state as far as people even wanting to locate there, people wanting to stay. That's a good point. I mean, here in Illinois, once again, going in the opposite direction, they're trying to get a progressive income tax from a flat. Uh, Illinois actually had a pretty good, I mean, they had a, a flat 3% tax rate on income, which was actually pretty competitive. Uh, they increased it, uh, they're talking about making it permanent, and now they're talking about making it progressive. So you have states like North Carolina who are obviously going in the right direction um, and then trying to control spending and, and taxes and Illinois going in the totally opposite direction. Um, Dan, you, you wrote uh, one of our publications, uh, 10 Principles of Federal Tax Policy, which is, is back there. Um, I guess, you know, Obviously, there are different ways of doing it, but if you just had a blank slate, what, what do you think a good, sound tax code should look like? Well, apart from the ten principles of tax policy, which I think lays it out to simplify it, uh, I think you got to have. A, I think you have a, a consumption-based system is is in my mind the soundest economically and it's the soundest morally. Uh, you mentioned the uh, 
the drive to a progressive tax system in uh, in Illinois. Of course, we got a progressive tax system at the federal level, and, and I think when we get into this debate, we have to recognize that there's no moral or economic basis for a progressive tax system, none whatsoever. You know, the crowning jewel, and I make this point in my ten principles paper, my tenth point you know, of a sound tax system is is that one is based on on a constitutional formula. Now, the crowning jewel of American liberty is the idea that all citizens are created, are treated equally under the law. They're not entitled to equal benefits necessarily, or, or equal outcome, I should say, but you're certainly entitled to equal treatment under the law. And we, we reject the idea of invid invidious discrimination in every other area of the law, but in, when it comes to tax law, we embrace it as though it's somehow a, a moral high ground that we should, that we should pursue and, and cling to, this idea that just because you, your social status and your economic status is different from somebody else's, that the law should treat you differently and in fact punish you for that. And the point that I make in the 10 Principles paper is that it, it is just simply morally unsound and in my mind constitutionally illegal to penalize somebody who's benefited under an economic system through the, through the, the lawful and peaceful pursuits of his of his business endeavors it's just it, to me it's fundamentally outrageous and so i think the move away from progressivity is where we have to go and and you you made the point and and this is this is backed up in all of the literature everywhere you look whether it's at the federal level or any state studies that have done the the, the minute you increase progressivity into a system or, or you or you uh, increase the progressivity that's already been introduced into the system you reduce revenue and, and that's just a fact of life, because what you do is you disincentivize people for earning more money. Well, if, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna uh, be productive and push myself into a 39.5% bracket or a 40% bracket or a 60% bracket, however progressive, however fair we try to get here with this, then, uh, then uh, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lose my incentive to go out and produce more. As a business person, I'm gonna lose my incentive to, to grow my business, to, to increase my, my capital base, build buildings, hire workers you know do all these various things that are necessary to drive the income uh, the engine of, of production the uh uh, ben over here made the point about uh, the liberal, uh, the liberal uh, terminology and, and how we can't, you know, uh, we can't utilize the liberal terminology. And in, in, in the tax debate, that question is fairness. You know, that that that, that term, that magic word that the, the left always uses is we've got to have a system that's more fair. Well, what does that mean? Well, what is a system? What does it mean to have a system that's more fair? But does that mean we introduce more progressivity? In my mind, we've got to take away the progressivity if we're going to have a fair system. That's great. And I, I think those are all great points, and, and I've always kind of been a, in favor of more of a consumption-based tax system. I mean, rich states, poor states, which you mentioned, you know, always the, the, the couple states that are up the top usually have no income tax because we're not taxing that productivity. That's right. That's right. Um, on the flip side, though, and I think... Uh, Bob, you made a good point about the spending side, um, but before we kind of get to that point, I wanted to ask uh, Senator Berger, what was kind of, would you say, politically, what, what was the biggest challenge to getting to where you guys went? Obviously, you're going to have to make, you know, uh, you're going to, you know, make changes and, and things like that, but what, what were the big challenges? How did you fight through those? The, the biggest challenge we had was uh, was dealing with the special interest uh, who uh, wanted to, uh, to to see tax reform. They just didn't want to see tax reform that impacted their particular deduction or their particular credit. And so uh, one, one, of the classic, <laughs> one of the classic moments uh, that we had was uh, Senator Bob Rucho, who I credit in North Carolina with, uh, with actually uh, keeping alive the idea of tax reform uh, in advance of, uh, of our session last, last year. Uh, Co-chair of our finance committee, he stood at, uh, at, the, uh, at the podium in the finance committee and he asked uh, in a meeting of the finance committee for every lobbyist to raise their hand. And when they raised their hand, uh, he pointed to them and he said, now these are the folks that are going to be opposed to just about everything that we're going to do. And, and it, was, it was absolutely true because when, we, uh, when, we, when we're looking at modifying the deductions that folks are entitled to, uh, one of them is we limited the amount that uh, folks can deduct on their, on their income taxes uh, as uh, mortgage interest. 
Well, you can imagine which special interest was, was opposed to that. Uh, we did a number of other similar things, and, and those special interests really were, were getting together and, uh, and opposing of the, the entire package simply because uh, we, were, uh, we, we, were, we were trying to make sure that we did something that uh, reduced overall rates for everybody, and uh, the, the special interest opposition was, was the biggest impediment. And, and really the interesting thing about that is those were all folks and all uh, industries or lobbies that had historically supported our members. And so it made it that much more difficult for our members to, uh, to, to, to push to, uh, to pass the bill. And I would say that uh, that, that uh, pressure became more difficult to overcome on the House side of things than it was on the Senate side. But let, let, me, let me address that if I can for just a second. One of the principles that I talk about in the 10 principles paper, the 10 principles of sound tax policy, is the principle, principle of neutrality. A sound tax system has got to treat all businesses and all individuals the same. If you are in the business of granting special interest to one group at the expense of, a, at the expense of another, you're going to create economic uh, disadvantages, you're going to create an economic, unfair, an, an unfair playing field, uh, an unbalanced playing field in this situation, particularly when you're using the, the money that you take from one industry through tax policy and give it to another through tax policy. I quote in my paper the, uh, the, uh, uh, 19, the 1874 case of citizen savings and loan versus Topeka, where the Supreme Court said, uh, to lay with one hand the power of government on the property of the citizen, and with the other hand to bestow it upon favored individuals to aid private enterprises and build up private fortunes, is nonetheless a robbery because it is done in the forms of law and it's called taxation. So th this is the neutrality thing that's so important in this debate. Pete, the, the businesses have got to be treated the same across the board. Yeah, I think part of that is, you know, when you try to, so if you gave them tax breaks and then you're trying to get rid of them, that's, that's where you actually create uh, almost a self-defeating mechanism where, where they, they're going to hold on to that regardless of what the rest of the plan sure there. looks like. And, and, and that's why I think it's important that if you're going to if you're going to take away these tax, you know, this myriad of tax deductions and tax breaks, which I think is a good idea to do, you have to also simultaneously lower the rates. You've got to lower the rates. Uh, let's kind of flip to the, the spending side. Uh, Bob, you, you obviously with state budget solutions, you guys focus a lot on pensions and things like that. Um, uh, in addition to pensions, but you can talk about pensions, what, what is driving all the, the spending at the state level? And, and, and is pensions the, the big thing that everyone needs to face? Or are there other, I and mean, we've been talking about pensions for, it seems like a decade, and no one's really doing anything about it, especially well, in Illinois. Let me go back. When I was a much younger kid, I was an auditor for the U.S. Government Accountability Office. And out at the Pentagon and Post Office. Those were interesting. I could talk all day about that. Yeah, but nothing in that experience prepared me for the state of Washington when I became a state legislator and the lack of accountability in state budgets. And as we look around the country, in virtually every state, your budget is broken. You take your current budget, you had caseload increases, and you had inflation, and that's new base budget. And really, is a question asked, what K-12 have you done with the money we've already given you? And so we've been advocating very strongly through ALEC to go to results-based budget or performance-based budget. We look at outcomes, and I know your budget office is interested in doing that. Hopefully something happened there, but there are several states there. But in Washington State, back in, 19, in let's see, 1993, we had a $2.8 billion budget deficit. And the governor was very liberal. When he met with me and he said, what can we do to get support of groups like yours for a tax increase? I said, well, governor, you might remember that in the early 80s, the Republicans controlled the House and the Senate and the governor's office, and they raised tax rates, and they got less revenue after they raised it than before, and the voters threw them out of office. He said, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I said, well, a few years later, Governor Mike Lowry, and you were the budget director in the House, and you did the same thing. You raised tax rates, and you got a lot less money, and you were thrown out of office. He said, well, let's try it your way. So here's the key in your state, seriously. If you can particularly for legislators, if you can go up with five to ten core functions of government, and in, in the case of our governor, he came up with ten core functions of government, then every one of the 3,600 state programs had one of those ten core functions or they were gone. Good idea. Then he set up work teams, which included the private sector, and the work groups met under those ten core functions. Now the good news is, 
if they had continued that and you had a change of power with the new governor coming in, three of those core functions, I don't think the core functions of government at all, they could wipe out all the programs, they all were linked, they'd be gone. But I did the healthcare group, I sat in the healthcare group, and it was really interesting because the groups were told you can't raise taxes or revenue. So they spent four hours trying to come up with a way to get more money if they didn't raise tax or revenues. Can we charge more for copies? Can we do this? Can we do that? Then finally, the, in Washington State, we had more than 10 groups involved in healthcare. So they all put their mission statements on the wall. And this was really an eye opener. None of the agencies had the mission of improving the health care of Washington residents. Uh, wow. The mission were how many lost time accidents do we have? You know, how many people come in the door? How many shots do we give, et cetera? Once they came up with improving health care of Washington residents, they were able to evaluate the programs. And so all the groups had a budget. They all finished. Nine out of ten groups were happy, K-12 wasn't happy. They need more money, and they begged for, you know, just give us 600 million more. K higher Ed made the mistake and gave them 600 million more, because K-12 promised they would produce a better qualified student in higher ed. They'll never do that again. But the difference is, when you go to outcome-based budget, it changed the whole focus of the hearings. When you come into the hearings, now they say, what have you done with the money? and you budget in outcome measures. Now some of your states, like Texas and all, in the budget they put outcome measures, but they don't link it to the budget. Now we're, we're making some progress in Minnesota. Peter's group just put out a report, small budgeting for an era of limits. Hopefully the Minnesota legislators will, will pick that up. We do a lot of work with Governor Pence in Indiana on that. But let me tell you the difference it makes when you're budgeting for outcomes. It, it, it's night and day. For example, if I were a legislator again, I would give no money to any higher education institution. Instead, I would fund the student. And the difference is night and day. In Washington State, we have six four-year colleges. After six years, less than 50% of the kids graduate in two of those four-year schools. So imagine you're the parent of the student that has a six-year college loan and no degree. Right. But what's worse, across America, last year, 50% of the college graduates could not find a job or got underemployed. And so there's something we're doing wrong in that. And the same thing, you start looking outside the box. Why are any legislators allowing higher ed to build any college dormitories? Learn from the military, privatize the dormitories, allow the private sector to build the dormitories and collect the rent. You're out of it, you don't have to do it anymore. We go right down to, you know, if you want to save money, K-12 higher ed, part of social health services and corrections. And you got it there. Uh, pensions is a big problem in most states, and we can talk later in that. Well, well look, first of all, let me let me second what you said about outcome-based uh, budgeting. Cre this creation of a list of core government functions, y you all have a list right in front of you. It's called your state constitution. If, the, if, if you can't square the spending with the clear mandates of your state constitution, why is your state spending money on You're that. Right. That's one of the principles I talk about in the 10 principles paper. The, 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 the spending, the tax policy has to support only the legitimate constitutional functions of government or it needs to be out. But let me say one practical thing that I, I think every state can do, and, and you alluded to it. Um, I, I think most states have what we in North Carolina call the continuation budget. And, and what happens is that the debate about uh, what your budget looks like is one where you spend more money, but uh, the language is that you've cut the budget. And it's because what's happened is in your state budget act, uh, there's a requirement that for, for every department there is this uh, calculation that takes place for automatic increases in the department, and that begins that becomes your starting point uh, for the next year. Uh, one of the things that we did in this year's budget in North Carolina is change that uh, so that uh, next year's budget will be based on this year's spending. Uh, plus, uh, there, there are a couple of other things in there, but uh, rather than have uh, have next year's budget start at a number that may be 5%, 4%, 3%, whatever the number is, higher than this year's budget, and then when you spend more money, it's, uh, it's called a cut, uh, you, you change that uh, political dynamic. It makes it much easier, at least that's the theory, uh, it'll make it much easier for you to, uh, to try to get a handle uh, on your spending. Now, 
some of the, uh, the, the, the interest groups out there uh, have uh, looked at that and they, they are already talking about how the schools are just going to be woefully underfunded. I've spent a lot of time early on talking about zero-based budgeting. And uh, I've, I've come to the conclusion that, as a practical matter, I don't know that you can do zero-based budgeting for the entire budget uh, in, uh, at the state level uh, on an annual basis. Uh, but I do think that you can, uh, you can infuse a little more honesty in your budgeting by starting with last year's number. And then those departments that say they need more money, if you have more kids coming to school, then, uh, then, then we add to the education budget. If you have fewer people coming to school, then you reduce the education budget. Uh, you, you, have, you get closer to the idea that, uh, that, that, that the budget meets the needs that you have. And if you have a department that last year uh, was unable to spend all their money, uh, first of all, I think the folks in the bureaucracy would get rid of somebody like that. But uh, if you have, you have a department that doesn't spend all their money, then you can reduce their, uh, their appropriation uh, rather than it being automatically increased. And when you bring it back to what it was the year before, you, you're, you're being told that you're cutting their budget. So uh, I, I think that's a, that's a huge step that, that, that can be made. Obviously, anything that you do ultimately requires you to have the votes in. You've got to have the will to do it. And you have to have the votes, and and so uh, a lot of a lot of these sorts of things are things that I think Republicans and Democrats should be able to agree on uh, in many respects. Uh, and I know that that the average person out there, your constituents, uh, understand that in, in connection with if they have a business, if uh, if, if they're trying to do their personal budget uh, at home, uh, they don't automatically add to that budget uh, without actually looking at what their needs are. So, uh, so it's something that I, I don't know who came up with it in government to begin with, but it was certainly someone who had the idea that we need more and more of it, which uh, which is not oh, yeah, something I think is accurate. 1974 Budget Control Act. I mean, the federal government is what was created. Yeah. Just, let, me, yeah, let, me, let me add something to what uh, Dan and I just said about the significant impact of linking to the Constitutional Court of Government Principles. We were at ALEC a couple of years ago and had the opportunity to sit at the head table with David Walker, the former Comptroller General of the U.S. And I said, David, has GAO, since I've left, ever done a report of how much of the federal budget is consumed by one of the enumerated powers of the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 8? He said, yes, we did it. It was a couple years ago under Bush. You ready for this? 35% of the federal budget is an enumerated power. Uh, that much? I'm surprised is that high. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be today. Oh, wait a minute. I just balanced the federal budget. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, for sure. You can't Tom. use the Commerce Clause on everything. Yeah. And, and give everybody a 65% tax cut. But Tom's going to do that for us, right? Um, I want to work on a little bit or talk about uh, some more of the spending issues. Well, one big issue I alluded to, um, and I'm not going to ask Bob how to fix Illinois' pension system because it's slightly impossible at this point, but we did see some states take some really good actions. Oklahoma's one of them. Well, what can states do realistically? Um, obviously, a lot of uh, think tanks and other groups have been pushing to go from a defined benefit to a defined contribution system. Is there some lessons maybe from Oklahoma Oklahoma or other states that well, what states can do to fix those problems. There, there's some lessons, but first let me just say the hidden thing in most states is OPEG, the unfunded retiree health care thing. And, and just to give you an example, in one little state called New Jersey, the OPEG liability is $56 billion. I mean, <laughs> that is not a contractual right in most states. That's something that the legislature can adjust right now in most states. Now we've got California, you said you can't do it. But in terms of the pensions, uh, the, the, the mistake that so many Republicans make, and I make a lot, is by vilifying the unions. If you take retirement security for all, we don't want to take away anyone's earned retirement security. Now, if there's blooming, spiking, et cetera, we can cap that. But messaging is key. Retirement security for all, we're going to protect the benefits you've earned. Now, the other message that I cannot communicate very effectively, in virtually all your states, higher education faculty love their pension system. They love it. In most cases, it's TIA CREF. It's a defined contribution model. They can transfer from state to state. They can transfer within the state, from Kansas to Kansas State. It goes with them. They know in a given year if the employer ever underfunded it, it's transferable, et cetera. Right now, across this country, 
36% of the K-12 starting teachers will not work in the system long enough to vest in their pension system. They should be natural people to want a DIA graph model, but yet somehow the union leadership has so blasphemed that you can't even get that point across. So we're, we're trying to go up the message, and one of the things we're trying to do is get some videos of uh, a couple that one of the spouses is in higher ed and loves his pension system, and the other is in, maybe we should do it in Illinois, the other is in K-12 and is worried about the pensions not being paid. Uh, but pensions really need to be identified, and what we urge you to do in your state is to come up with three numbers. The CAFR data, the report that's reported on your annual consolidated annual financial report, the data that your state's going to have to report to Moody's because Moody's is going to require, not for reporting, but when they go out for a bond issue, a different number, and then the third one, which is the one that AEI and State Budget Solutions uses, is the risk-free rate. And to just give you one example of how those three numbers vary, we'll just take the little state of Florida. Under CAFRA, they have an underfunded pension liability of $20 billion. Under Moody's, it's $103 billion. Under risk-free, it's $154 billion. And I would say that if we were somewhere around Moody's or moving towards the risk-free, Florida would have done pension reform this year. But as long as they're talking about we're going to assume we're going to make a 7.5% return per year or 8% return per year, it's ignored. Now in Washington State, what they did last year, which I still can't believe, in order to reduce the amount of money they'd put into pensions, they assumed state employees would stay working for the state longer, and then when they retired, they died within two years. Uh, <laughs> And see, most legislators don't see these hidden assumptions. They have no idea what the key assumptions are. So we are strongly in favor of either defined contribution or hybrid model. So you know, one, one of the things you have to do is stop digging the whole deeper. Now, under the Internal Revenue Code, when you make these unreasonable assumptions like that, you, you, you cannot assert a position in tax court that's based on unreasonable this, assumptions. This is state government. <laughs> we don't have generally accepted accounting principles. <laughs> Um, I, I have one more question, and then we'll kick it over to the, the audience. Um, in North Carolina, um, well, it, more broadly, one, one of the ways that states really like to get revenue is through kind of sin tax, and is trying to find these these evil products like Coca Cola or you know beer, hammers, hammers, hammers. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but but one, one of those products that they're starting to tax as a sinful product is uh, vapor products or e-cigarettes. Now, um, here in Minnesota, uh, they ta was the first state to actually tax these products, and it was a 95 percent of wholesale value, which is actually higher than I believe traditional cigarettes, which you would think are more dangerous, therefore should be taxed higher. Um, in um, North Carolina, though, you guys actually did pass a much lower tax. What was the process behind that, and why do you en enact any tax? Well, there, there were two things that we had concern about. One was uh, that if we were going to tax that product, we needed to do it in the context of reducing a tax somewhere else so that there would be some balance, and we, we were able to do that. The, the second is that uh, North Carolina is the home of, uh, uh, of Reynolds, uh, which is one of the larger uh, cigarette manufacturers, and they're also fairly uh, involved in, uh, in e-cigarettes. And uh, what we saw was uh, states were going to look at taxing e-cigarettes, no question about that. The simple sales tax on, uh, on the sale of the product was not going to satisfy most folks around the country. And, the Minnesota example was a prime example, a prime uh, mover as far as that's concerned. So what we wanted to do was come up with an alternative that other states could look at in terms of taxing that product if it was going to happen, and uh, that was uh, that was the driving force behind it. Any other comments on well, taxes in well, general? My, my, res my, my response is, is is what I said earlier about neutrality. If the product is legal, then why should it be taxed differently than some other legal product? All right, we, the, the, the gentleman on the, on the earlier panel made the point about, about hamburgers, you know. If we, if we, we all agree that children are obese. We, should we tax hamburgers at 200% of their fair market value to keep kids from eating hamburgers? I mean, it's a legal product. It's, it's sold with the proper labeling. People understand the risk. The same with cigarettes. It's a legal product sold under proper labeling. People understand the risk. You have to live in a cave to not know what the risks are of cigarette smoking these days. And I don't know about e-cigarettes, but I'm sure there's data on those as well. I, I don't know. 
But the point is, how, why do we treat these legal businesses differently just because we make some moral judgment as to whether that particular item is, is good or bad for, for us? It's, it's outrageous in my mind. I think usually it's just about getting more revenue, right? Sure, I mean, there's just, that's, that's, the that's an easy way. There's only a certain percentage yeah, of the right. population that's who exactly. consumes these products. Yeah, exactly. um, with that, uh, but just, just in defense, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we like to hold debate. <laughs> I do think that uh, there, there is the, the argument that it, it is a legal product. Uh, it is a, a product that is a superior alternative to folks who, uh, who smoke uh, from a health standpoint, sure. from the standpoint of, uh, of the cost of of, uh, of healthcare on a long-term basis. And there are some folks who would like to kill the product off early on. And um, some folks would say that what Minnesota did uh, was, was something that if every state replicated that, uh, it, would, uh, it, it would in essence uh, make it, well, it would make it more difficult for that uh, industry to, uh, to really gain some footing and uh, uh, and actually flourish. So I, I, I don't. They shouldn't be taxed at all, right? I agree with it. And <laughs> when when uh, when when I die and go to heaven, I'll be in that perfect world where things uh, like they should. That's coming with you. That's great. Um, was that if anyone's got any questions uh, in the back? An argument, an argument against this, uh, keeping the sin tax would be the impact it has on society based on the negative use of it. Just with like that. Well, as, as I said earlier, the the the, uh, the idea is to have is to have neutrality across all of the incidents of taxation. In other words, you want the base to be as neutral as possible. You don't raise revenue by raising rates. You raise, you raise revenue by spreading the base, keeping the rates as low as possible, and that way you don't have a situation where people are picking and choosing which products they're gonna buy. This one has a higher tax, I'm not gonna buy that. I'll go these over here, the one has a lower tax. If you have the base uniform across all products and services, then people don't pick and choose which products they're going to purchase or not purchase. Everything is treated equally for tax purposes. Well, that's not my point. My point is the people that are in favor of sin tax says there are negative impacts out there caused by the misuse of these particular things, such as health care. Then, 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 go ahead. Such as mental health care uh, costs. To sure, for smoking, of course. Drinking and driving, and so therefore it needs to be taxed higher. Sure. But what I'm asking is how do you refute that argument? Because that's what they're going to come from the legislature. If we agree with you, which I do. Well, well and, and you make a good point, and I understand your point. And my response to that is, if the product is so bad and the consequences to society are so bad, make it illegal. The same legislature that could tax it can make it illegal. Then you got to bootleg it. Well, and, then, and, then, and, then, and, then, and you then, see that with some of these products. Right right right. Yeah. Cigarettes exactly. And <laughs> yeah, that's like me. With all due respect, the traditional tax neutrality arguments almost certainly wrong. Almost certainly, almost certainly wrong. Uh, because it ignores the fact that different groups and individuals have different demands for public services. You think about a simple world in which uh, the federal government provides only one service, national defense. <coughs> Just a very simple world. If you have uh, two industries, that have differing demands for national defense services. One is very capital intensive, the other isn't, uh, to pick one example. Then, there, then it's appropriate to tax one at high more highly than the other. And the problem with the neutrality argument that's the traditional, and I'll get to the point in a moment, is that it, it, it ignores, it focuses only on the efficiency of resource allocation in the private sector not in efficiency and resource allocation on the public sector. That's why my colleagues at AI, there are two or three of them, have been arguing in favor of a carbon tax uh, on neutrality grounds. They want to replace capital taxation with a carbon tax are precisely why I argue that we have a huge internal debate on this issue within AI, is they're ignoring the fact that capital owners are very likely to have uh, much higher demands for, for various federal services than non capital workers. There's a the further matter, which is a little bit different than the point you're making, is that a carbon tax is much more hidden. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, I feel an illusion problem. But that's and, that, and, that, and that's a point I make too. Taxes have to be visible. I really would be much more careful than when I have a ledger paper which I want to Google. But I think you're not being sufficiently careful about defining what neutrality means. Uh, when you drive the implication of it, I'd be, I'd be uh, I think the treatment for all horizontal, which is what I think you're well, that's essentially what I'm saying. Yeah, and my my and my response is that when if you've got a government that is that is providing benefits based on the constitutional formula and not the the capacity of special interests to drive uh, 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 federal benefits, tax benefits, then then you can introduce this neutrality that I'm talking about. Now, in, that's not correct. Suppose you had a government doing only the things that it's constitutionally empowered to do. Right. All right. then, this, then this individual doesn't have a greater benefit for the blessings of liberty than I have just because I might have greater capital costs than he does. Uh, he may have a lower or higher demand for those particular public services than you do. Well, we're only talking about defense. Defense is not a public service in the traditional sense. Everybody benefits equally from a sound national defense no, that provides benefits. security everyone, at our borders. Everyone benefits. Not everyone benefits equally. It depends on the demand for defense services. If I have a lot to lose from a foreign invasion, I demand it more highly than another person who doesn't have a We all have the same and no, same no. thing at stake from a foreign invasion. I disagree with that. I guess we'll agree to disagree. Uh, Hal? <laughs> Thank you, and I hate to know, but Hal worked again from South Dakota, and, and I appreciated the Senator's comment about zero waste budgeting. Because, uh, it can be done. We did it in South Dakota for 15 years and budgeted it. Um, 77 to 92, every five years you took one or two different departments and you, you go through them systematically. And we did that. It was while I was out of the legislature, they got tired of just too much work, so they were doing that. <laughs> and, and just to follow up on that, we, we have uh, made a decision that next year what we're going to do is uh, try to separate out our policy committees from our budget committees so that our uh, our appropriators uh, have uh, adequate time to, to delve deeper into uh, various aspects of the budget. One of the things that I kind of feel like it isn't touched on enough here, and I hope that uh, we can do it, but our state relies on sales tax. We have no income tax, either corporate or personal. Um, and some people will say, well, you've got to pay franchise tax, which technically is a, is a tax on banks. There shouldn't be there. But when you look at when you look at South Dakota and the growth of our revenues, it exceeds the inflation rate in at least eight out of ten years, and most of the time nine. And when I say that, it might be at six or six and a half percent when the inflation rate is around three. And my my concern that I wish we would address in this group, as well as the balanced budget amendment, are things like the limitation on spending and taxing. Because if you switch from an income tax to a sales tax and make them equal today, the, the growth in the consumption exceeds the increases in a lot of cases in the uh, taxable dollars that are earned by the people of the country that, uh, or the state. And if you look at it, it's, to me, it's something that really needs to be addressed because, and I'd like your take on it because I've watched South Dakota over the years, for 30 plus, 35 plus years. And, uh, we need it um, just to keep it from growing. Because if you take government, if you take legislatures, even a conservative place, and uh, 95 was a good year, we had uh, $13.5 million in appropriators came in, two days before session was over and said, hey, we just found $13.5 million. And we had just replaced 20% of the real estate taxes for homeowners in the state because of excess revenues. Oh, here's 13.5 million. We need to know tomorrow how to spend that 13.5. There were a dozen, 13 of us that said, hey, let's put it in a reserve account. But you give it back to the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we could give it money to produce something. And the other, and this is on my side of the aisle, which is sometimes considered the right. Um, <laughs> Our guys, the rest of them, figured out how to spend 137 million dollars. Sure. Because you had 13, so why not spend 10 times that? It's their idea, right so they come in with And they will spend it. Government will grow if you don't limit it. Yeah. You've got to learn 
that that's the real key to everything. There's nobody that's serving the people that doesn't want his pyramid to get bigger so he's higher and he's paying more. And they're all doing it. Yeah, I would make a point to that. I mean, whenever we testify on, on tax reform issues, we always bring up the spending side because, as you say, you can have the best tax reform in the world, but unless you restrain you know, people from actually going out and spending all that money, it's not going to matter. I mean, that's what we saw. We saw huge growth in the 90s and early 2000s. People were spending because we were bringing in all this revenue. Sometimes they were even still cutting taxes, but we were still bringing more and more revenue. What they did, no, they didn't just sit on it or cut taxes more or put into a reserve fund. They spent it. So, sure, we, you know, we were doing great. The economy was doing good, so we were bringing in more revenues. Um, but, you know, we weren't restraining spending, so then when it took a dive, we're all like, well, where'd all the money go? Well, just, and the, and the, go ahead, I'm sorry, you go ahead. Well, just, just to add, uh, Cal, Colorado had a really good spending expectation on the Tabor. The only thing wrong with Tabor is the unions got together and passed another initiative that required them to increase spending the K-12, which offset that. But So I think a Tabor initiative is good. On top of that, when you first got involved in ALEC, when I first got involved in ALEC, Pete DuPont was governor of Delaware, and he had the Delaware plan. They simply took the revenue forecast, 98% of the revenue they could spend, 2% went into reserve to vote up to 5%, and then it went back to the taxpayers and approved the tax cut. So if you do those two things and then do performance-based budget, you just solved it. I, I would just agree that, um, that, that legislators, human nature doesn't uh, end when someone it's the title of senator or representative, and uh, human nature, unfortunately, and doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrats on average, uh, human nature is going to be when uh, when a legislator sees the situation you're talking about in South Dakota, the vast majority are going to say, where can I spend it? Uh, especially if you can spend it in my district. It be even better. <laughs> I think we got time for probably one or two more questions, if we have any. Um, Actually, I did want to bring up one, one more issue. Um, on the pension side, I mean, are, what can states start looking at? Because Illinois, I just feel like we're, we're, we're kind of underwater. You know, we have Democrat controlled overwhelmingly. Uh, is, I mean, is there anything realistically that you think a state like Illinois, or are they basically going to have well, to Well, there's a lot you can do, but the Republicans and the legislature don't want to do it. I mean, Illinois is kind of an interesting state. The pensions are really underfunded. K-12 Chicago, the Chicago teachers, or Chicago taxpayers, put in the employer share for school district. That sounds right, they did it everywhere else. But for the rest of the state, the legislature picks up the employer, the school district share of the pension costs. So as a result, the local school districts throughout Illinois, other than Chicago, don't have any expense for pensions. So what do they do? They pick up the employer share of the pensions. This is a system, system that's totally underfunded. They should require the employees to make a contribution to pension. I mean, the thing is, in Chicago, uh, they just had a strike last year, I guess it was, and gave another big increase. When we debated and put our report on the Chicago teachers thing, we said that's really in trouble and they're not going to have enough money. And the head of the Chicago teachers retirement system came back and said, state budget solutions are wet. We have at least enough money to take care of teachers' retirements for two years. Wait a minute, if I'm an active teacher, what does that mean? There's no money there in two years. And the mayor is saying, what, 56% increase in property taxes? It's gonna have to, yeah, that's what they're gonna have to do. So it's gonna be interesting to see what happens until they address that issue. One of the, one of the challenge, challenges I, I think the legislators have is that um, uh, we are answerable to voters. Right. And voters love teachers. And so uh, anytime something is couched in terms of uh, the, this is for the teachers, it becomes difficult to, uh, to, to, to push against that. I think the best thing that can be done as far as pensions are concerned is to make sure that, uh, that voters, taxpayers, understand the cost of things. Right. And we've done so much, or we've seen so much done uh, over the years to hide costs. I think pensions is probably the best example of that. And open. Yes, and in, and in Minnesota, the debate's even more based because it's not about teachers, it's about the children. You know, we have to take care of the children. Um, well, I just wanted to make a couple quick announcements. Oh, actually, we'll take one more question, I guess. But I did want to get everyone out on time, so you better make it quick, Art. Thank you. I don't know if this panel can 
speak to it, but uh, most states have a significant portion of the budget in federal funds because we're in this federal programs. Um, federal government, you know, keeps uh, running the deficit. Maybe, I don't want to speak to it today, but maybe another emerging issues from what states can do to inject some financial responsibility into the federal government. And I mean, I have no idea, but I know some, somebody has to do something. And because we're all supporters of federalism here, um, if there's any suggestions, uh, I, mean, I, I know it's a big question uh, for North Carolina and every other state, but what we're urging to Alec is all states do what Utah did. Come up with a financial ready North Carolina, financial ready uh, Mississippi, financial ready Minnesota, in which you go out and require every agency to identify all the federal funds coming in. You'll be surprised to find out that some federal funds are coming in for K-12 that bypass the legislative process completely. Then the next question is, are the federal funds coming in, what are the maintenance of effort requirements and how much is it costing you to get that? Right. And then Utah went another step further. There's going to be federal cutbacks. There's no question about that. They said, what does a federal 5% cutback require and what does a 25% cutback require? And then my second point, which is tough politically, the Obamacare decision on Medicaid had some really good points in there by the Chief Justice. States are independent and sovereign entities. And Sometimes they have to act like it. You have to say no sometimes. I mean, if you look at the cost of K-12 requirements, this was when, uh, 12 years ago, we had a U.S. Senator, Slade Gordon, who had the Senate Finance Committee look at the cost of complying with the, getting the federal dollars, which at that time was about 7% of your, your budget came from the federal government. 62% of the school district's paperwork requirements was to get that 7%. Maybe it's better to say no. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's precisely what I was going to say, what you just outlined. I mean, this, this is right on the money. What is it costing the states to get this federal revenue? And is it easier and cheaper to just send the federal government a photocopy of the middle finger with the Ninth Amendment written underneath it? Yeah, I think those are all good points. I mean, the, the other thing that I know a lot of groups, I know Hal's very involved with, you know, Article 5 type constitutional reforms, uh, you know, whether it be a compact or through a convention of the states. I mean, that is one way of trying to restrain the federal government. Obviously, that's a big lift. Um, but, you know, I think we need to, uh, I think you're right, we need to see what states can do to, to push back at the federal government however they can. I, I don't think there's one easy answer, is unfortunately the answer, but uh, I think we need to try to do as much as we can. At the risk of making folks stay longer than, than, than they want to. Um, uh, I actually think that uh, the best thing that states can do is to push as much as possible for a federal balanced budget. Uh, I think as a practical matter, that's uh, the, the thing that will come closer to getting us on the right track. Because from personal experience, I can tell you that saying no to Medicaid expansion is not an easy thing. Because, uh, and we've said no in North Carolina and intend to continue to say no. However, uh, there are a lot of interests out there that they're very much concerned about maximizing the, uh, the, the withdrawal of money from the federal treasury. And, uh, and, and they are, in many respects, our friends. It's sort of like the tax reform effort uh, in connection with the spending side. And, and so it's, uh, it's a difficult thing. And, and you're right, uh, our education department gets money that does not come through the legislature, comes from federal government that create programs that, uh, that end up putting paperwork loads on our teachers and uh, creating uh, fiscal problems for, uh, for, for our, uh, our budgets. Transportation is another place where there's a lot of federal money that, uh, that comes into states that bypasses the regular budgeting process and creates uh, uh, real problems in balancing the transportation budgets as well. Um, I just want to make a couple quick announcements, but I did want to give a round of applause to our, our great panel. Uh, thanks. <laughs>
I also want to thank all you uh, who stayed here. Um, I know it's a, it's a long day and we, we tried to cram a lot of stuff into a short period of time. Um, like I said, we do have surveys. If you could fill them out, we really want feedback. Uh, we like getting new legislators here. I know some of you, uh, Hal and others, have been very good at helping us get lawmakers who have not attended a Heartland event to a Heartland event. That's That's been very helpful to us and we're, we're definitely grateful for that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, our staff, but we got Alex here, uh, Matthew Glanz, um, and Logan Pike. I want to give them a round of applause for their great help all day. Team doing with that. Um, and also, I mean, I would, you know, some of you may not have any staff, um, or if you maybe have minimal staff, please use Heartland as a resource. Email or call or tweet or you know text, whether it be Logan or Matt or myself or or Alex. Let us know how we can help. You know, let us know what we can do to help you, whether it's putting on an event for you guys, doing research. If you say, hey, what, can I get some more information about, you know, zero-based budgeting? If we don't have the best resources, I mean, I can put you in contact with Bob. I mean, we, we cite their information. I mean, we, we can put you in contact with some of the best experts out there, and that's what we try to be as a resource to you. So please, please help us help you. So um, with that, thank you so much for coming. Um, we'll, I'll be around. A lot of my staff will be around tonight. So um, if you want to talk about any other issues or talk to any other speakers, I think some of them will be catching flights. But otherwise, uh, thank you again just for, for coming. So thank you so much.